to um, shoot what my continuing you are considering. Yes, I consent to be recorded. Okay. Um, I would like to, um, can you give me screen sharing privileges so that I can um, start sharing stuff? So my specialty is, um, you know, conflict research or subnational violence, political violence uh, research when people uh, want to, um, you know, do joint research projects with me, the first thing I ask them um, are a lot of people killing other a lot lots of people. So if they say yes, then I join that project. If there's nobody killing anybody, then I don't join the project. That's basically what I do. Um, the second question is, if nobody's killing anybody, is there a chance that somebody is going to kill somebody? If the answer is yes, then I also. So that's basically the grim and gray reality of us conflict researchers. We basically um, do really um, grim uh, forms of research. So <clears throat> I'm, I think we have people from lots of different disciplines just to you know, uh, add the context of um, what I'm doing. Um, so let me start. Um, oh, wait, sorry, sorry, sorry. Ah, wait, no, that's <laughs> so sorry. That's, uh, ah, that's a narrated um, version. So I'm not going to um, do that just a moment. Uh, technical problems. Okay. So hope everything is fine right now. So basically, um, the title of my presentation is Computational um, Social Science in Crisis Areas, Lessons from Syria and Iraq. Uh, first of all, when I talk about social media as conflict event data, I first want to talk a little bit about what event data is, because we have people um, that, don't, that, that don't come from uh, conflict research. So in conflict research, we have this thing called uh, violent event data or conflict event data, uh, which uh, basically gives us uh, a long-term um, you know, idea about who's fighting whom, uh, whether you know, how many people have died or how many people got affected from the conflict. Uh, the type of conflict. So one of the most famous types of these data sets is the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project or ACLED uh, project, uh, which is you know, freely available online. Um, they basically separate um, events based on battles, riots, explosions, or remote violence, violence against civilians, um, and they basically also do, uh, you know, monthly or yearly change, you know, whether there's more violence in the world, whether there's more war in the world, whether there's, there are more protests uh, in the world and events and fatalities. Um, the other very famous data set that we use is Uppsala Conflict Data Program. They join uh, with Peace Research Institute of Oslo. Uh, what they do is UCDP PRIO um, data sets. Um, they basically sort casualties, state-based violence, non-state violence, one-sided violence. Um, there's also dedicated data sets um, like global terrorism database, which uh, only specifically log uh, terror attacks across the world. So, you know, more red parts are more, you know, terrorism prone. Um, other parts, yellow and greenish parts, are less um, conflict prone. So what does um, an event data set look like? It basically looks like this comma separated value CSV uh, file in which, you know, um, the um, number of the conflict, the code of the conflict, the side of the conflict, the side of the target country, whether there are other sides to the conflict, um, type of conflict, whether it's a border conflict, whether it's a you know, territorial dispute, um, origin date, end date, uh, number of casualties, number of affected people. So that's basically what a conflict uh, data. And in quantitative conflict research, um, we use these a lot. Um, these are very, very, very popular. Uh, actually, in the last 20 years, I would say that quantitative conflict studies is one area that really 
exploded hugely. It became so popular, um, not just in international relations and political science, but I'd say in comparative sociology as well, because what we're doing essentially is less about international relations and more about uh, sociology of violence, essentially. So these are very helpful. I mean, these are imperfect, obviously, because um, there are types of events that we know of, and there are types of events that we don't know of, obviously, because it's a crisis area. How do you know that something exists in a crisis area? If you don't have anyone observing the conflict at the local level, there's absolutely no way you can learn about these things. So most of the time, uh, historically speaking, with, with, you know, before the advent of social media and the internet, uh, most of these data sets relied on newspaper accounts or um, NGO reports, basically, you know, how many people died, where, you know, where was the clash, uh, what happened, what type of violence is that. Um, but as internet became more widespread and as social media became more widespread, we have this new, you know, form of event data, you know, social media and war and social media as war event data. Uh, that became quite substantially popular. So how did social media uh, change the war, change the dynamics of conflict? One, it of course enabled sub-state actors, militant groups, mafia organizations, criminal organizations, drug cartels in, for example, um, Latin America. Um, it enabled all of these sub-state or sub-national actors <clears throat> to conduct propaganda um, at lower barriers of entry. It rendered propaganda easier and also cheaper. Um, it rendered communication far easier because now when you go to any battlefield in the world or any um, um, gray area of administration, such as areas that are controlled by uh, militant groups, uh, areas uh, controlled by drug cartels or mafia organizations. Uh, everyone has a cell phone. Everyone has a smartphone. Everyone has uh, access to Instagram, Facebook, Twitter on real time. So previously, it was near impossible for us to get information from these areas. You would either be you know, kind of like a war reporter and go into these places and get information. Or you would be, you know, an ethnographer um, who basically has the willingness and the resources to go into those places and access to those places um, and basically do research uh, in that way. Uh, there are also people like, for example, at Harvard, there's Vera Miranova, who's an excellent ethnographer who just basically goes into conflict areas without any, you know, um, you know, guarantee for life. Uh, she's, she's really amazing, but it's also very dangerous. Um, she spends several months basically, you know, living in close proximity to milit militant groups. Um, you, you can do also that kind of ethnography. But now we have social media. Um, we have a historically unprecedented level of data coming from conflict zones, thanks to social media, because everyone uses them. But also we have historically unprecedented levels of uh, misinformation and miscommunication. So social media renders both information about conflicts uh, easier to get, but it also gives us a lot of junk. It also renders misinformation very widely uh, available. Um, what does social media do in conflict areas? It basically, uh, it has mixed results on recruitment. Yes, you can technically recruit more people through social media. So, so think from the perspective of a militant group. Why would you use social media? Because it's a war zone. Are you crazy? Why, why use, well, why have an Instagram account? Why have a Twitter account? That's, that, look, that sounds very counterintuitive. Um, they do that for various reasons. One, to recruit uh, more people. Uh, but in the case of, for example, uh, cases of ISIS, drug cartels in uh, Mexico, um, militant groups in Ukraine, what social media gave um, those um, networks is a lot of cannon fodder, a lot of low quality recruits. Uh, you can't really get veterans or battle hardened recruits through social media. 
you get you know high quality militants again through human networks uh so it's basically more junk um it significantly enabled researchers ability to gather large volume of granular data both qual qualitative and quantitative um so far social media uh, based on research it has no effect on conflict intensity or likelihood because there's one line of research recent research in conflict study so does social media uh, increase the in, in, intensity or likelihood of an armed clash uh, from happening? Does that render conflicts uh, more likely? Uh, current research says no, there's no um, you know, positive or negative impact of social media on conflict intensity. But this is specifically what I'm going to do right now. Uh, so this is this presentation is based on uh, my Alan Turing Institute project, which was recently finalized. And now we're building that into our recent Tubitak 1001 project, which is going to go on for uh, three more years. Um, we're going to build upon uh, our findings from the Turing project. So that is something that I really want to uh, dig in, you know, uh, explore further whether social media um, and the use of digital communication really affects uh, conflict intensity or likelihood. Uh, social media hasn't changed how wars are fought, uh, but more about how they're communicated. Um, so uh, it's not about, you know, social media isn't a kind of war. It's, it's, it's not a kind of you know, fighting um, tactic, but it really changes uh, the dynamics of how war propaganda is made or how war communication uh, is made. Uh, and social media doesn't lead to polarization on war opinion, but allows greater exposure of both sides um, to each other. Uh, and finally, traditional hierarchies and networks still matter. Still, um, decapitation strikes on uh, a militant group or uh, a mafia organization um, it doesn't change the dynamics, even after the introduction of social media as a communication um, matter in that regard. So. Technically speaking, we were told that technology and war would give us um, lots of robot soldiers, lots of AI, or, you know, uh, AI drones, a lot of you know high tech stuff. No, social uh, basically technology gave us social media uh, in war zones as a way of self branding for militants. Everywhere you go in a battlefield, you basically get tons and tons of selfies. This is a very important, both methodological and theoretical, I think, uh, issue, because technically you would expect less information to be disseminated from a war zone. Why? Because it's a war zone. It's supposed to be secret. Um, it's very counterintuitive to get this much data um, from uh, a war zone. It's it's very very counterintuitive, but um, whenever you go and you know scrape Twitter, when you go, go try to you know profile scrape Instagram or uh, scrape things like Odnoklansky, you know Russian and Ukrainian version, or V Contact for example, um, or Flickr, you see tons and tons of battlefield information, and this is absolutely crazy, very counterintuitive, but. Everywhere you go, you have selfies, you have social media texts, you have uh, a lot of men coming together, taking selfies. Uh, it's a way of perhaps asserting your identity to the battlefield. Um, I've been doing some you know, interviews with war returnees as well. So that's one uh, thing that I ask uh, people, you know, I see a lot of you know, selfies from the battlefield, you know, do you think this is a mistake or do you think um, this is something deliberate? And the information that I get is always that this is very deliberate. This is not a mistake. Um, this is very deliberate because most of uh, the militants that you see on a battlefield are very young people uh, and they have no notion of death which is you know a very grim thing and they don't have this um, sense of being afraid of death 
which is, I think, very important. What they fear in a battlefield is being forgotten. So they, they don't really fear uh, the, the, the idea of you know, dying in a battlefield because they don't understand uh, the concept of death uh, very seriously. What they worry about is that what if I die and everyone forgets about me? So in order to reduce the likelihood of getting forgotten, they use social media as a primary platform uh, of asserting identity on the battlefield uh, and asserting agency on the battlefield. You know, this is me, look at my fatigues, camouflage, look at my weapon, look at me, how important I am, look at me, how serious is the work that I'm doing. So that's this theme that pops up quite regularly, um, not just in content that you see on social media from battlefield, but also the text uh, that is attached. Because when you, you know, go to Instagram and post a picture, um, you also type something uh, at the bottom, the text data um, that uh, I scrape when I do these things. Um, in On Twitter, you have, well, the golden age of doing these things where I think 2015, 2016, 2017, but still even today, uh, you have tons and tons of photos from the battlefield, tons and tons of text, not just from off time uh, in a battlefield, but also there are a lot of information from a war zone related to actual violence. So somebody firing against uh, you know, a position, somebody launching a rocket, somebody dropping you know, an airstrike, um, somebody killing somebody, they're all on social media. And militant groups meticulously and very consciously log battlefield event data as a form of um, propaganda, but also public relations. Uh, it's very important for them. So gradually from 2014 onwards, uh, I started to see extremely detailed accounts of war events in Syria, in Iraq, in Ukraine, um, I don't, my specialty isn't that, but we also see a lot of research in Latin American countries with a lot of cartels or you know, mafia organizations, for example, there are people who do Italian mafia organizations, social media use, which is a very fascinating <clears throat> line of inquiry. So along with those social media posts, what, you, what we started to see are lots of photos lots of location data, which I think is even crazier because again, war is supposed to be secret, but when you look at the type of information that we gather from uh, the battlefield is that an overwhelming majority of battlefield events have, are, are geotagged, meaning that like they deliberately turn on the location information on their uh, cell phones. Um, and more than 66% of the battlefield data we get from Syria and Iraq are geotagged, which is far, far higher compared to other forms of data that we get from uh, non-war zones like, like New York, like New York, like Paris. We don't get you know, that much location information, but in a war zone, everything is, almost everything is geotagged, which is, uh, which is crazy, yes, but it's useful for me as a researcher because now I have a very interesting form of event data, which has an automated date, which has an automated hour, like the, the time frame, which has um, an automated location data. Then what I get is I scrape it and basically infer from um, the data about you know what kind of uh, you know, equipment, whether any equipment is mentioned. So here we have, you know, man pads, you know, uh, manual um, air to uh, ground to air rocket systems, for example, anti-tank missiles, whatever. So they use all of that information in their texts. So what I have is almost perfectly curated event data. Um, that militants are basically creating for me. And it's crazy, like everywhere you go uh, in a battlefield, um, you, you uh, have these things. And um, this, I think, is incredibly um, you know, fascinating, but it's crazy at the same time. 
And around that time, uh, when I started this um, research at the University of Oxford, um, people were already uh, automatically scraping selfies or, uh, you know, protest images or ev everything, whatnot. Um, so your Instagram selfies were being scraped, your Twitter selfies or Twitter images were automat automatically scraped to be sold for brands for monetization purposes. So this was something that was already uh, being done. So here on out, um, our project on, um, wait, sorry, I have to. Um, so here on out, our project on automated um, agent-based modeling of civil wars project uh, begins. I, I can't, uh, hold it. okay. Anyway, so basically what we did is that we uh, started a project that automatically scrapes social media data in real time based on preset classification uh, criteria that we introduced. So first Syria, um, you know, latitude, longitude, Iraq, Ukraine, images taken with the front camera because every photo that you take with your cell phone is automatically coded according to whether you use the front camera or the back camera. I don't even know which one's which one, but um, basically this, the selfie camera that you use um, is basically logged automatically um, in, in the metadata. It says that it uses the front camera. So basically the front camera can be scraped separately from the back camera, which automatically gives you selfies from uh, a war zone. Then we basically use entity extraction um, and we use Alchemy API in order to extract entities. Then the hardest, for example, part comes from. So uh, how do we deal with redundancies from a battlefield report? So we're trying to get an event data and we are trying to get rid of multiple reportings of the same event data. So we have to do redundancy checks. So first thing we do is um, we used to do, but we are not doing this in our new Tuvitak project, but in the Alan Turing project, we used uh, automated translation, uh, reducing multiple language reports of the same incident into, the, into one single reported event. Because when let's say um, a, a militant destroys a tank, you're going to get uh, hundreds of accounts, videos, and images of the same event that pops up on social media. So you're, you're, we're trying to eliminate all those multiple reports and get them into one single report. Then, uh, by the way, how much time do I have? Like, how, how much? What's my time situation? Um, it's up to you. I mean, we mm -hmm. didn't really specify in any duration for the seminar part, but. Um... 45, okay, yeah. 50 minutes maybe, but I mean, sure. you can go longer really. We have until yeah. 7.30 about, let's say, yeah. Sure, so. sure. Um, so what we did is also automated reverse image search so that uh, disinformation is very common in the battlefield. Um, the kind of uh, battle image that people are sharing as if that's, that's something that's happening recently can be related to a previous event and they may be resharing it. So you need to do an automated reverse Im image search. You also have to use video fingerprinting. So Google video search to verify the genuineness uh, of visuals. It's very important that um, the militants um, that are, you know, posting in social, social media, you know, we destroyed an ISIS tank. Uh, it may be uh, a video from Afghanistan from 2014. You need to do um, retrospective uh, redundancy check, but both visual and textual in order to get rid of that. Now at the level three, we run into the most difficult part of redundancy check um, because uh, let's assume we're uh, looking at, you know, Kurdish militant groups in Syria and Iraq. Um, one very common thing is that how do you code Parastin, which means protection? Uh, it can refer to Parastin Zanyari, which is like an official protection group, Yekinean Parastinega, which is an, an in of unofficial um, and outlawed um, you know, militant group, or a generic term that some you know, um, youth group uh, 
created. So you, you basically get parast in, in a lot of places. Like how do you disaggregate the term parast? And so here we relied on a lot of region experts and assistants who speak the language and know the context. But this is the most, um, the final part is the most labor intensive uh, part of that. So this gives you, we did this for a lot of different groups, um, you know, jihadi groups, Sunni jihadi groups, Shia jihadi groups in Ukraine, pro-Russian uh, militia, militia groups, anti-Russian militia, militia groups. So this is basically an example of how we did Kurdish armed groups. So we have a date range, we have a country range, we have pre-coded event types um, that basically forms uh, the corpus of our event data. Uh, an ethnic identity corpus uh, and different uh, connotations. These are both in English, in Turkish, in Kurdish, in Arabic, in Farsi. Um, so groups that we are uh, looking at um, and specific names which can pop up uh, in um, events that basically we um, are looking at. Now, basically when you put them all together, what we have is essentially something like this. This is from 1st of April 2015 to 1st of October 2015. We basically ran um, an initial kind of uh, demonstration view. So can we do this like time series um, image? And this is practically what you get. The, the yellow parts in this graph are um, the, the pipeline infrastructure in southern Turkey. Um, and let's say, you know, can we map violent attacks conducted by outlawed Kurdish groups along um, the Iraqi Turkish pipeline, which goes into the Botash terminal in Jehan, for example. So this is <clears throat> a very common way of, you know, how we can use this, you know, very practically, you know, kind of political risk analysis, violent risk analysis. We didn't use it for academic research, but this is when uh, my group um, used this, um, you know, to, um, you know, build a demonstration of, you know, what we can do. So this is, um, you know, Kurds, ISIS, and the Free Syrian Army in Syria and Iraq. Um, and this is, you know, less uh, clean. This is, this is dirty data because what you see is that there are like some also some dots on the sea, which, which is silly because it's unclean, it is dirty data. Uh, I just wanted to give you an idea of how raw data looks like. Uh, this is not cleaned. This is not um, a result of a redundancy check. This is just like exactly as we scraped, uh, as we put. But even this gives you a lot of clusters um, of event data. So I think a lot of people are asking me um, questions from the chat. It is, is it okay that I answer them like at the end of uh, the presentation? I actually just posted that. We will be collecting questions in the Q&A oh, okay. session. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, cool. Awesome. Um, but even this like gives you a more detailed event map compared to uh, you know, more formal event uh, maps you can get from, sorry. Uh, for example, those are Institute for the Study of War um, or um, you know, Human Rights Watch. This is a far granular uh, violent event map uh, compared to uh, all others. And you can also do, you know, fancier stuff. This is something that we did with um, a couple of friends from Cambridge Physics. You know, how can we introduce between the centrality uh, connection mechanics to predict ISIS territorial control over the long time? And um, do I have a laser pointer? Uh, Laser pointer. Yeah. So here you would see that the between the centrality basically clusters around a town which basically connects uh, Iraq uh, to Syria. And then this was something that we uh, presented at an academic conference, not an IR academic conference, but a physics conference. Uh, and we basically said, that, you know, look, we use social media data to build an event data set. And using between the centrality, we um, argue that. Um, ISIS is going to do its final last stand in this area. I, I, I even like forgot uh, the name of the town. Um, but two years after we made this uh, presentation, New York Times reported that the last ISIS stronghold was precisely there. 
So it gives you an idea of how useful um, you know, these types of event data can be and how useful it becomes when you basically cooperate with physicists, computer scientists, as interdisciplinary as you can get, the more fascinating and useful results uh, you can find. And then we basically adopted the same methodology and applied it into Ukraine. You know, these are selfies that include violent um, text and it really gives you um, you know, fighting flashpoints. And this is again, uh, that is un unclean data. This is still dirty data because you see uh, that there are uh, violent event data like offshore in the sea. Of course, these are you know, dirty data that needs to be cleaned, but cluster wise, it gives you a lot of, um, you know, accurate data and a lot of stuff to do both political analysis, but also theoretical analysis and speaking. So, how can we take this to another even further next level? Like, can what can we learn about uh, the text of those you know violent groups in a way? So, this project uh, we did at Oxford was with uh, was more ISIS specific. Um, so, nat we use natural language processing. So, sorry, um, my PowerPoint is not obeying my orders recently, but. Um, we use natural language processing, ISIS specific. I think most of the people who are here know what natural language processing is. Um, so we use LDA, Latin to which that allocation. Uh, so it basically gives you topic models in a very large group of text, and it automatically um, sorts it uh, according to topics. We use semi-supervised machine learning because the uh, unsupervised machine learning gave us, uh, you know, imperfect topics. So we refed um, the data by basically helping the machine to you know, cluster them um, properly. So we did semi-supervised. This is, I don't think this is necessary for this group because I think everyone knows what LDA is. So first we basically taught the machine on how to interpret and how to read ISIS data first from static text. Um, static texts are the big and Rumia, two of um, the magazines that um, you know, ISIS used to use frequently. Now they're all busted. Um, but first we, you know, ah, I, I hate you PowerPoint. No, because this is a narrated thing. I muted the narration. It just automatically went, goes into the next slide. So we taught our classifier how to read ISIS texts. So first we did uh, English and Arabic language of Dabik and Rumia. So we basically input that, it, we asked this to do lexical analysis, syntactic analysis, sem semantic analysis. Um, and then it gave us some clusters. Then we corrected some of those clusters, for example, into like role of women, role of violence, role of law, role, you know, uh, in-group identity building, out-group identity building. So all of those clusters um, were as a result of semi-supervised machine learning. So these were uh, the topic clusters that uh, the machine gave us. So the idea is that you know these are strictly you know uh, topics that we get from uh, ISIS text um, but then when we applied this um, to uh, ISIS social media texts when the machine learned how ISIS speaks from its magazines it actually gave us a lot of um, good um, topic models uh, that we use you know what should the ideal Muslim do? What should an ideal Muslim woman should do? How should you fight? Uh, how, what is your, you know, how, how should your relationship be to God? So all of these are um, individual topics. Um, so according to ISIS, who is the primary external enemy? Who is the primary internal enemy? Um, so from there, we basically built um, topic cluster Polls, basically, you know, what is um, the frequency between topic one, which is basically what a, uh, you know, good Muslim does versus topic 10, uh, what are um, the topics or words that ISIS use frequently to define, you know, uh, outgroup, uh, so to speak. Um, so these are quite important. So this is very really straightforward. 
um, what should uh, a man do versus what should a woman do kind of topic cluster. So man is just like, it gives you like, you like kill, it becomes up quite a lot. But when we go and basically, you know, um, when they define what a woman should do, you have, uh, you know, husband, bless, family, you know, during the day, what should you do? There's hijab, there is messenger. So then uh, we have another in-group, out-group uh, classification, you know, in-group classification and then out-group classification on topic three, so topic five. So these classifications are very important to do narrative analysis or it's not discourse analysis because discourse analysis is something else, but uh, it gives us um, long-term narrative and textual analysis uh, of what, what ISIS does. And then uh, we basically tried uh, um, topic model network analysis. Um, how does in-group and out-group violence topic models? I show you a lot of in-group and out-group violence topic models because this is a working paper for us right now. Basically language of uh, jihadism, how jihadi groups uh, talk, um, how they define the, themselves and the, the outside. Um, so <clears throat> uh, another project that we are in how jihadi groups talk on social media before they expand and after they expand to um, a new territory. What are the most common words that um, pop up as a result of um, um, that? So our preliminary findings, and so there are uh, two working papers that we are still trying to uh, build from uh, this project. Um, ah. Sorry. Okay. Um, so we can talk about um, you know these because you know these are ISIS specific um, findings. But what we're going to do next up, uh, what we want to do next up, if my okay. So one, we want to compare ISIS pre and post territorial control vocabulary with other armed groups that expand and administer. So that's something very important. That will be a very important theoretical comp contribution. Um, we want to increase the number of topic clusters to get more variety on rebel framing, advertising, and propaganda efforts. And social media is a very good place to do a research on that. So social media as event data works really well there. Uh, we want to compare and contrast with um, state-led counterinsurgency and post-territorial vocabulary. So yes, ISIS speaks like that, or militant groups speak like that. But what about states? Because states also fight with those groups and states also get territory back from them. Let's say like Syrian army and ISIS, Syrian army and Kurdish groups. So how do state actors talk about these things as opposed to non-state actors? That's a very important um, field of research as well. Um, so ultimately, I think what this research does is that one, it uses open source research algorithms to generate geospatial data through an extended period of time. Uh, we did it for two years, but you, we can do retrospective analysis and get more data um, from uh, you know, historical data. It introduces techniques to help algorithms sort out data redundancies on its own with minimal reliance on human verification. So instead of hiring like 60 assistants, you can actually build to a great degree algorithms that, that can do these things on your own. So that instead of hiring 60 assistants, you can just hire six or seven for things that machines can't do. Um, Advantage wise, we can handle large volumes of data um, and this kind of research, this kind of methodology is best used for high volume extended period conflict data processing. If I can improve redundancy removal algorithms further, it's going to require even less human involvement and a lot, a lot of things we will be able to automate. And this is made better, uh, better than human centered conflict data production if only event type um, uh, and uh, event location and event date uh, is uh, used because um, there's also the bias component of human centric conflict data production because human curated means that research assistants or researchers are going to log these things manually uh, based on the kind of information available to them. Uh, whereas if you do this in an automated social media analysis format, it is going to be um, 
at least more objective at scale because when uh, we're dealing with millions and millions of data nodes and if we're going to use 60 assistants differences coding differences between those assistants are going to become a huge problem with automated algorithms we don't have that problem at least even we when we have that problem it's more uniformly distributed so that we know what the problem is whereas if we do like 60 assistants at the same time it's very difficult to know where where what, what the problem is and at what point but also this um, method has a lot of disadvantages so human-centered conflict data production is far better uh, for the study of high detailed events that also include things like weapon type used or attack motives like why the attack uh, took place and also unclaimed attacks in that kind of low end or small end research human centered uh, research is far better so this is only better when the size of, and the volume of data that you're using is like enormous but if uh, the size is not that large uh, human centered conflict data production will always be better uh, humans can remove remove redundancy more reliably but cannot do this over a large volume of visual data so if your data set is small you should always use you know human um, data analysts and i think the biggest problem that i haven't written here is the issue of data bias or data availability bias because um, this is a very core topic that people at Constance University, like Niels Weidman, that they, they work a lot, or Jacob Shapiro, that they, they work a lot on this. Um, the only way that we can get conflict event data from social media is where we have uh, a 3G or 4G network. And in a battlefield, uh, most of the time you don't have those because the infrastructure is destroyed. So the kind of data that you get from a battlefield is very, very biased. And you can't really use these things as any form of representative uh, data. So as social media conflict uh, scholars like us, we have to be very careful with the, this kind of bias because the kind of bias um, will only give you conflict event data where um, that kind of connection infrastructure exists and you shouldn't uh, take that for granted in a war zone because uh, like there's the likelihood that they're all destroyed but it's not as bad as i built because a lot of militant groups in a battlefield also use like direct satellite link like satlink so you don't even need like a 3g network um, a lot of groups use that. A lot of gr groups can afford that. It's not very expensive. So they can still use like makeshift um, like 3G network and any, any kind of data network. It's not difficult for them to actually build that. But then again, there's another bias in which you are going to be um, limited to groups that can afford this kind of infrastructure versus groups that cannot afford this infrastructure. So there's another kind of data asymmetry uh, there. So I think this is um, the most, uh, you know, fast. I mean, I'm going to, I say fast, but I think I spoke a lot, but this is basically an overview of what we did at the Alan Turing Institute, like because it was recently finished, what we came up with, uh, the purpose of that funding wasn't really uh, that, you know, you have to, um, you know, do a lot of like theoretical findings because we were collaborated with a lot, of, a lot of computer scientists and physicists. The idea was to build a tool and build uh, a method rather than like a theoretical contribution to anything. But now we have, you know, we're evolving into this new Tubitak project that is going to be uh, strictly based on theoretical findings or theoretical contribution of these methodological things. So um, let me end the show um, here. Wait, how, how, what's, what's happening? Um, I'm trying to um end screen share do you know how i can end screen share okay uh, i can stop, stop share. share okay all right
cool. Thank you so, so yeah, much. That was really perfect so timing. For... <laughs> yep. Yeah. Awesome. Well, also, thank you so much for this really inspiring presentation. Uh, we have a long list of questions already, so I'll jump start to the first one. Um, I'll just read them out loud. The first question is, maybe you already mentioned this, but how did you notice the selfie uh, is from Battlefield? Um, that's the Dan Gündoğdu's question. And then uh, maybe we can collect uh, a batch of three questions first. Uh, Burak Osturan asks, how long do you believe that uh, method will yield reliable results since the soldiers will be educated to consciously use social media that might not use geotagging or worse, use VPNs to hide their exact location? Um, we, the third question is going to be from uh, Mehmet Arslan. Uh, if you could unmute yourself and ask. Or if you would rather type it, that's yeah. fine too. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Thank you very much for the great presentation. Uh, it's, it seems a really great contribution. Uh, my question is about uh, generalizable, generalizability of this phenomenon to other conflict zones uh, and somehow connected to uh, my research, which I just started to work on. Uh, to what extent do you think the wide use of cell phones and social media by militants in Syria and Iraq uh, is general, generalizable to other conflict con contexts? Uh, for example, uh, Taliban is known for systematically targeting cell phone towers or threatening mobile network companies to switch off cell phone towers except just a few hours a day. Or in Turkey, like uh, so-called leadership of PKK is strongly encouraging its militants uh, not to use cell phones and also attacking cell phone towers very often as well. But like uh, one explanation uh, comes first to my mind is engagement of a like, government actor that has very sophisticated surveillance and precision targeting capabilities, uh, which deter insurgents like uh, using uh, cell phones. Uh, I, would, I would love to hear your thoughts on it. Thanks. So, so would okay. you rather three collect questions. more or, I mean, I, we can collect no, more no. if you want. No, I mean, three is good, I think. Like, like okay. it's, let's answer those and so. Um, so how do I notice whether um, a selfie is from a battlefield? Um, there was this slide um, that I showed at the beginning, like, there are certain criteria for automated scraping. So um, one, a selfie data, meaning that, you know, it should be an image. Uh, it should uh, contain uh, the metadata that it was taken with the front camera. Uh, it has to come from um, the, um, um, the, the, the you know, Iraq and Syria and Ukraine latitude and longitude. And um, it, there was actually um, a broader work that went uh, into that. It has to contain text that contains violent um, event referrals, which is something that I mentioned earlier. Like it has to contain violent text. There's another way to do that, which would be um, uh, would be using like machine learning and automated detection of violence in images, meaning like whether uh, like tensor flow and that kind of thing, whether it sees like um, a machine gun, whether it sees an explosion. Um, there, there are people who are doing experimental work on it, but um, like to, to try to infer these things from text data is much more reliable. Although I think in like three to four years, I think there will be uh, algorithms that can, that can just straight up recognized from an image or video and automatically classify it, not just as a violent data or not violent uh, event data, but it can even like, can tell you what kind of equipment was used by automated uh, designation. So how I notice that an event, an event comes from a, a battlefield is that it has to contain specific corpus of words related to war and conflict, the kind of list, long list of corpus words uh, and event types I mentioned uh, in a previous slide. So second question is a huge problem. How long do you think it will method yield uh, good results? What if 
actors are educated about this? What if uh, they use uh, VPN or what, what if um, they just don't use these things? Um, so that is a major problem, definitely. Um, but so far, um, I haven't noticed any indication that anyone is educated about this because like conflict event data keeps flowing on social media um, because I like keep constantly scraping that data and building a data set. Um, there's no indication that um, even if they use VPN, the data volume that I get from uh, a battlefield either in Syria and Iraq is exponentially increasing. So let's assume that some of them are using VPN. Uh, There's still a very tiny, tiny, tiny minority within the broader, you know. Uh, so how long do you think I, we can keep doing this? I don't know. We can like still do it. And there's no indication that this is changing. Like this is, this sounds like a very troubling thing. Um, but the data right now isn't uh, really like, um, I'm, not, I'm not worried about this. Like, there's no decrease. To the contrary, there's actually a huge increase in battlefield data um, that I've been scraping um, from this. So, everything you mention is potentially a problem over the long term. Um, but currently, and probably over the next two to three years, I don't think this will be uh, a huge problem. Even if you, even if they are a problem. Um, th like they won't change the general trend of things because most people, even if they use how to use these things, even if they know how to use these things, uh, at the end of the day, most of them don't. And I think there's a paper to be written there. Like if they know how, how to use these things, why aren't they using these things? Um, third question about generalizability uh, to other conflicts. Um, I don't study other conflicts, so I don't know. Um, so what I know is like Syria, Iraq, Turkey, and Ukraine. Um, across all of these like four countries, uh, trends are very similar, which actually gives me a lot of hope in terms of generalizability uh, of things. But we should also keep in mind that conflicts are very cultural. Everything about how uh, people fight, how they organize when fighting are hugely cultural. So we do expect um, a lot of variances among different conflicts uh, in terms of how they use social media, uh, whether they share uh, location data, whether they share you know, the actual you know, uh, conflict data. Um, so that is uh, a huge uh, problem. Um, what is this? Yeah, so widespread use of uh, cell phone towers. This is something I mentioned in the final slide. There's a huge data bias issue. Uh, proximity to cell phone towers, whether they can. But um, the technology has improved so far that you don't need a cell phone tower anymore. You can just build a sat link and just upload uh, through um, you know, uh, a third uh, connector device, which provides you 3G. Um, you know, connectivity without any reliance to cell phone towers. So uh, even though you go blow up a huge chunk of cell phone towers, you still get a lot of social media data from the place where you destroy the cell phone tower. So there's another question there, you know, does cell phone tower targeting work? I mean, so far as a researcher in terms of how much data I get, I, there's no change of cell phone tower being destroyed and the kind of data that comes from uh, a battlefield. Uh, so Taliban um, destroys a lot of cell. So if they're destroying like everything, I don't know, like I didn't study Afghanistan, but um, if they're destroying everything, I would assume that there would be uh, a problem or in the case of PKK, like they explain um, their you know, militants not to use um, cell phones, but no, they, they do a lot of data pops in from, you know, both organizations. So even, even if there's a ban on social media use, at the end of the day, those groups still use social media. So um, it is uh, the part about there being a ban and the overall social media output of those groups, these things aren't related. And the best example to that is Russian military social media use. So 
um, in during like the Crimea uh, annexation and uh, the war in Eastern Ukraine. Um, Russian Duma, uh, the president's office, and uh, the chief of staff of the military issued five total social media bans on soldiers because they're oversharing. They're sharing like strategic key location in the background. They're taking ir like irresponsible selfies and they're basically ruining operational security from the images and videos they take. Um, so uh, there was a huge like carpet ban on, on all Russian soldiers. Um, and it was quite interesting to notice that none of those bans had any effect on the volume of data that you get from Russian soldiers. It's something psychological because you have to keep in mind that even if you ban social media in a battlefield, this is more of like war anthropology, but um, when, when we think about the battlefield, don't like think about people who are just constantly firing and engaging in battlefield. 99% of a battlefield is boredom. People are bored. It's very boring. 99% of the time, you just wait. And it's such a psychology that when there's an armed clash, you just like, most of the people ask for trouble because they're so bored of waiting constantly all the time in the battlefield, both militants and soldiers, that they want something exciting. War is so exciting compared to the boredom of the, the battlefield in general is that most of them prefer fighting and the possibility of them being you know, dead as a result to just waiting. So social media and cell phone uh, is perhaps the best friend of anyone that sits in a battlefield uh, because it gives them constant real time like excitement and something to do. So even if um, you try to ban social media as a general, let's say, you get such a huge pushback from your soldiers that eventually that ban becomes impossible to enforce. Nobody listens to the ban because the boredom of the battlefield compared to how irrelevant that order is, compared to how much fun that cell phone and social media, because it enables you to just like self-advertise, keep in touch with your friends or whatever. That's so valuable that you being court-martialed as a result of uh, you know, not following through with that ban is far, far, far more significant. So, uh, the, the, the thing, the connection between something being banned and a soldier or a militant not doing it is completely irrelevant. So that's something very important that I noticed. Thank you very much. Should I uh, read out loud the, the following three sure. questions? And some of them you may already have addressed, but uh, I will read them regardless. So uh, Aisha Gunarman asks, can you be sure if the account holder is geotagging their current location or not? Do you have specific studies on assessing the geotagging reliability of these war groups? Uh, and then next we have Patrick Brown, who has two questions. Uh, first, are we able to distinguish between different types of events such as conflict deaths, civilian deaths, strategic maneuvers, and training exercises? The second question is, are we able to use these methods to get better insights into jihadi group organization and size or recruitment? And um, the third question is from uh, Bagino Jam. I was wondering how often rebels refer to third parties in framing their objectives. Uh, what is the framing of rebels about? Objectives, ideology, recruiting militants, constructing civilian support. Um, so maybe we can answer these three and then uh, collect the rest later. Okay, um, so geotagging reliability, uh, it's a hornet's nest. It's one of the most difficult um, basically things to basically extract uh, from Battlezone. VPN is a huge problem um, in that regard. But again, um, this is a potential problem 
it's not an actual problem like the question i think it was brooks um question like how do we how how how, how can we be sure that um the geotag that we infer from social media data is actually reliable and it's not like vpn or uh, something like that um social media analysis again is not representative and it shouldn't be treated as a representative research in conflict research you have to work with trends not with outliers so um the data that you're going to get um even in like very high internet penetration like even if you're doing like purchasing trends or like brand management research in a place like london or new york even that is not representative uh, even when there's like huge internet penetration but that data is never representative so social what is social media data good for like it's good for trend analysis so in that regard um like one or two reports of an incident there is a high likelihood of that being like wrong or false but if from the same geographic location from the same geotag if you have 720 reports of the same thing that is when you try to take it seriously and that's when you start um, you know seriously considering logging that as a conflict data so what we're doing isn't like you know four reports of this event five reports of the of that event so we try to set up some kind of a reporting threshold so that one from this particular uh, geotagged frame you have to get a minimum of 50 reports of an incident within a time frame of 30 minutes let's say you have to build these kinds of criteria or th these kinds of thresholds to your algorithm um, so that you manage these types of problems, such as whether geotag is reliable, whether they're using VPN. Um, so you basically have to establish thresholds so that when um, an event report passes that threshold, then you take it and you basically analyze it as a social media data. That's the only way we could find um, to get around that. Otherwise, it's very difficult to log every single report uh, as an event um, that is going that's that's very tricky and that's very very difficult because there's a high likelihood of that being like false um, any kind of like misinformation disinformation um, so you have to work with trend flows in social media data um, what we can do over the long time long term is that we can assign threshold, different thresholds um, based on the intensity of the conflict. So for example, if we are monitoring a low intensity conflict, maybe you can put the threshold to 70 or 60 reports of an event, or if you're you know, following a high intensity trend, you can basically increase it to 300 or 400. Um, right now we're basically playing with different thresholds, but generally speaking, Geotag reliability, when you are dealing with data at scale, is yet not a problem. Uh, because if you're getting a lot of data from the same geotagged place, there's high likelihood that it is correct. Still, it, there may be a chance that uh, it may be wrong, but at least uh, it has a high likelihood of being successful or, or correct so that you can, when you do redundancy check or when you're trying to verify that claim, you verify maybe five event claims and not 500 event claims. So it's all about economizing and optimizing because the data sets that, you, that, that you're dealing with like four million, five million data sets, like you have to pick your battles at some point. So uh, it can be very difficult. How do we distinguish between deaths, within deaths, and exercises? So, so far, by using um, corpus analysis, um, we have more than 90% success rate in defining uh, violent event types, whether it's a pipeline attack, whether it's a terrorist attack, whether it's um, a small scale clash or a large scale clash. We can do these things. 
but it's very, very difficult to distinguish civilian deaths from military deaths or like militant deaths. That's extremely difficult. Um, whether something is an actual armed clash or a military exercise, that is relatively easy because military exercises use an entirely different vocabulary com compared to uh, actual military conflict because military conflict um, words are definitely, when you're doing automated sentiment analysis, they're significantly uh, um, sharper compared to military exercises that are usually in sentiment analysis. You get like something between um, you know, 0.4 to 0.6, so it means like something that's neutral sentiment. So it's uh, it's easy to do that. But I think this is a very good question because it doesn't give us that much options to deal with civilian deaths versus like militant deaths. The, the only way we can deal with this is just like taking deaths as a you know uniform thing, which is very, very problematic, I know. Um, but this is a methodological um, issue that we need to accept very honestly, I think. Um, what about jihadi group size and um, recruitment? It's, I think it's, well, first of all, um, in like social media um, data, uh, using social media as an event data, it, it doesn't give you any particular advantage versus whether a group is a jihadi or an ethno-nationalist or a criminal uh, gang, a mafia group or a drug cartel. It, it doesn't matter, like group type, group ideology um, doesn't really matter. Uh, what matters is whether those groups are very close to an active conflict zone or whether they're very distant to an active conflict zone. That's um, proximity to conflict is the key variable there. Um, can we infer anything from their, um, you know, size and recruitment? I don't think so, because again, as I mentioned, uh, these things aren't representative, so it's very difficult to um, gather anything from, because you can use bots, right? Like bots is an automated um, algorithm, which basically pumps up content and accounts. So imagine uh, a group which has I don't know, like 100 recruits using a bot and basically uh, creating an event data in an automated fashion everywhere. Like I can clean that data, that's not a problem for them, uh, but compare that group with 100 recruits to a group with like 3000 recruits, that's not really using social media so much. Um, I mean, you can't really uh, compare, so it's very um, difficult to uh, predict group size and their recruitment success. Um, out of this. Um, so Baginojo's um, question is actually very important. So I, I want to read it again. So I was wondering how often rebels refer to third parties in framing their objectives. Uh, what is the framing of rebels about? Objectives, ideology, recruiting militants, constructing civilian support. Um, all of those. Um, because it depends on the kind of uh, we can't really say that um, this particular group overwhelmingly does ideology and this group does overwhelmingly uh, recruitment. It depends on the challenges that that group is facing at the moment. So if that group is facing a lot of like manpower shortages, um, regardless of whether it's an ethno-nationalist group or a jihadi group or a drug cartel, um, they pump up like positive messaging, kind of in-group identity building um, messaging, such as uh, images, videos, and words related to, you know, look how socially cohesive we are. You know, we're a band of brothers where we do everything together. When you come here, um, you're not, you'll be like, you will fit in as, you know, a, a person. Uh, and that, that was something that ISIS used uh, a lot quite successfully because ISIS recruitment um, was predominantly about, uh, you know, come here and fit in socially kind of thing. They said very little, their framing was um, very little about um, like ideology. Of course, there was something like that. Uh, recruiting, uh, co constructing civilian support, they were all there. Uh, but for example, ISIS was always about fit in like as a Muslim person who can't fit in anywhere in your home country, come here, 
if you don't want to fight, don't fight, but you're going to fit in. Um, when we compare that to like YPG or SDF, it was always about like uh, fighting uncivilized barbarians, like come here and defend uh, civilization here, kind of a narrative. So uh, the answer to that question is that their objectives, their, their framing is always, um, it changes according to the problem that they're facing. Uh, the same kind of like narrative change, we can also see, for example, uh, in uh, not social media, but from their magazines, from Dabik and Rumia, for example, in ISIS. So the first few issues were all about like, come here, fit in and find your own family, like ideological family sort of. Uh, but then over time, it always um, came to the issue of what kind of knife you should use to stab people in Europe, kind of like it's, it's really like the, it changed into that. So um, it depends hugely about context uh, and not really ideology, I would say. Um, but since, um, you know, Bagin Hoja is in our, you know, Tubitak group as well, we're, we're, we'll actually look for that together with her uh, through the duration of this uh, project. That, that's something, um, yeah, we should definitely um, look into. Uh, I can just read next questions here. I can actually see those um, questions myself. Hujam, some of the questions were actually sent to me okay. as a private message, so I have okay. them on the list. But okay. we do have five more questions and about 15 minutes left. Um, if you are available, maybe we can go on for an additional 10, 15 minutes. Um, or no, we can I'm fine. Try to okay. I will, okay. I'll, I'll try to respond them like shorter. No, because okay. I, I really like this project, so I can basically talk about this like for five hours and you no, know, but yeah. I'll but just... we'll end, we'll love to listen. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I know yo, you have. Okay, so I'll just uh, read the next question then. Uh, that's from Oz Bulutkuk. Uh, in some industries, AI assistance is used for predicting certain risks. Is it possible to use similar methods on event data to predict any brewing conflict that can break out in a near future? And would redundancy have any large effect in such a research in comparison to other uses? And the next question is from Matt John Yilmaz. That one you can also read. Uh, interpreting conflict-related posts on social media or news articles um, and coding relevant variables often require certain knowledge of context of a conflict. Do you think it is possible to develop an AI solution to this? Or are we doomed to rely on human coders forever? And then the third question is from Engin Oluk. Again, uh, you can also see it on your screen. Does the social media contact moderation, which wipes out huge amounts of data showing pictures of extreme violence, create serious issues in the availability of conflict data? Yeah. Okay, um, so the, well, I'm going to respond to these very fast. It doesn't mean that these questions are unimportant. These questions are excellent and I love those questions, but due to you know, time constraints, I'm just going to um, reply to them fast. If anyone has any questions, uh, you know my email address, it's, it's on Kehas website. Um, but so can AI predict a brewing conflict. That's something um, people at Uppsala University are uh, doing that right now, not using social media data per se, but they're, um, and also ET, ETH Zurich, um, they're actually working on um, this project on, you know, can we actually forecast conflict? Um, and they're basically using the entire African continent uh, to test, um, you know, their predictions and what. Um, it's a very successful project. Now I think Mark John Yilmaz works in that project as well. Um, so um, yeah, Mark John, uh, the, the views project, it's excellent. Like the top people are working on it um, and it's great. Um, we are currently, I think um, still, um, I mean, not just like Uppsala, but I mean, I think like AI and conflict forecasting thing is it's it's still at its infancy it's it has a very very long way to go uh, one reason for that is that when you actually like look at views data i mean they do perfect work but um the, the kind of outcome is that 
conflict is going to happen where conflict is already happening, kind of like, um, yes, that's forecasting, but that's not always the type of forecasting that is going to help people necessarily because it, when you say that you know here there's a high risk of uh conflict because there is already conflict there it's like yes very predictable but then what additional information that's giving to me about the conflict right so um most of the time um i think this is a very useful line of research um uh, it's imperfect but i think it needs a lot of attention and investment but even at that, like, uh, like imagine an AI classifier, which you have trained uh, based on past events, like, would it be able to predict the Arab Spring? I, I don't really think so, because uh, sometimes some of the most transformative uh, episodes in world history um, happen uh, blindsiding a lot of people. Um, and the social dynamics uh, and cultural dynamics that create those uh, huge issues are very difficult to measure, even if you have the best like data source in the world. Um, I'm a skeptic, but that doesn't mean that I actively work in research clusters um, with groups that are trying to forecast conflict. Uh, I think it requires um, you know a lot of attention, and a lot of people are doing excellent work um, right now. Like if I had a million dollars, I wouldn't make that decision based on something that an AI classifier, you know, would um, tell me uh, in that regard. Um, in Mark John Yilmaz, interpreting conflict-related posts on social media or news articles and coding relevant values often requires certain knowledge of context of conflict. Do you think it is possible to develop an AI solution to this, or are we doomed to rely on human coders? For I think I discussed this a little bit. Like. We are doomed to rely on human coders for, uh, forever. But the question is, are we doomed to rely on 600 coders or only six coders? So that is a, a very important distinction for me. Uh, and I think um, there's an AI solution um, to automate a lot of redundant tasks, um, such as identifying you know, event data from text, from image, from video. There's a huge potential there, and it's, it's kind of like the low-hanging fruit at the moment. Um, and um, But at the end of the day, just like the Parastin example I gave you earlier, um, no amount of machine learning classifier is going to be able to distinguish between Parastin as a word. That's very you know, context-specific. Um, and you need not only a human coder, but you need an area expert. You need people who know these groups very intimately. So. I think the question that I have is that, are we doomed to rely on human coders forever? Of course, human coders will be there forever. But the question is that, let's say, you know, I'm applying for funding. Do, am I going to apply for 60 assistants or just six assistants? Because that's going to mean a lot in terms of the budget of um, the whole project, I think. Um, so scaling, economizing and optimizing, that is a huge deal, I think, and AI, will work wonders in that regard. It's not going to do everything, but it's going to do, I think, enough so that our job as human coders or human interpreters is easier, or at least we're not doing redundant stuff. Engin Onuk, does social media content moderation, which wipes out huge amount, yes, data, um, showing pictures of extreme violence, create serious issues in the availability um, of conflict data. Yes, that is going to be a huge issue, but that's specifically why um, you have to build a real-time classifier so that it scrapes everything in real time. You have to build a classifier and, of course, tons of storage capacity so that your classifier works like a radar that gets everything, like a, you know, API fire hose and everything so that you get tons of data in real time and basically classify uh, that. It's very expensive, but two years later or three years later, it's not going to be that expensive. It's very doable. So yes, social media content moderation is a huge deal. So that's why um, the best way to do it is to do live scraping of everything, like the one we have at the Oxford Internet Institute. Like, um, a, a cloud storage solution that basically scrapes the entire internet uh, on a daily basis, but it's very expensive. Um, but in, in these kinds of like social media and conflict projects, um, 
you need a huge amount of data storage for the initial live scraping. Um, but then once you have sorted those data uh, successfully, you don't need um, that much uh, storage. Your Gunesh, do you compare the news on newspapers with posts on social media? Um, method using newspapers may, may be less costly with almost the same information. Yes, but newspapers don't cover everything. Newspapers omit more than, I would say, 90% of the events uh, that happen. Uh, most of the time, what, when you, what you see on the newspapers is something very significant. Um, so that's why I think using social media as conflict event data is superior to using newspapers as social media as conflict event data. Um, new, there are costs and benefits, of course. Newspapers uh, have a higher likelihood of giving you accurate information compared to social media, which is just like um, a zoo. Um, but um, newspapers also don't give you everything. They only give you the most significant ones. So less significant clashes don't appear on newspapers. Um, so um, just using newspaper to build a, you know, conflict event data, it means that you're omitting 90% of uh, the events that's happening. So um, it is used uh, um, like GDELT project. I mean, they, they say GDELT, but I use, I say GDELT, uh, the, the um, project that is funded by uh, DARPA in the United States. They do this like real time uh, analysis of every single newspaper in the world with like automated um, translation mechanisms. They, they, but of course, uh, even when you look at local newspapers, um, not everything gets reported. There's reporting bias, there's censorship, there's self-censorship, especially in conflict zones and especially with regard to local newspapers. Um, so I think I will stick with trying to explore how to use social media as conflict event data, even as it is imperfect, I think it has far more uh, potential over the medium term. Excellent. So the next person in line had to leave early. So that was actually our last question. Um, I would Thanks. like to take this opportunity to thank you very much again, also on behalf of Glodem for this fascinating uh, presentation on a really interesting research and um, also, I thank our participants uh, for, for their questions. And with that, I think I can stop recording now.